there's the, the history of, of the guns in America is a history of America. Yeah. Going right through yeah. to modern times. And the other thing, too, is when we talk about guns, it's a very uh, all-encompassing topic. Now, my, my dad, for instance, is a hunter, and he has a gun safe that has a dozen guns. Some he's won in, like, raffles and stuff, and he just keeps them because it might sell them someday, but otherwise he's just got them, you know, collecting dust. He's got a rabbit gun. He's got a deer gun. He's got, you know, a duck gun. So he's, he's a rifle, I should say. So these are all hunting rifles. That's, a, I think, a different category as someone who grew up um, so close to nature where my family still go deer hunting. You know, they still engage in all of these practices of going out and you know, making venison sausage and then eating it Thanksgiving. This stuff still happens, you know, yeah. just like in the olden days. And, uh, um, but then you get AR-15s, and so the question becomes what becomes the gun you can have versus what you can't. And also now there's um, the constitutional, um, sorry, the Supreme Court precedents uh, with Scalia writing, I think, from the majority that people have a right to basically access a handgun in self-defense. They extended the Second Amendment to include personal safety, even though it's about militias and keeping down slave revolts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah, in the South, that was their that was their whole thing. Yep. About re well regulated militia were anti slave bands of trying to hunt down the uh, the little you know um, conclaves of of escaped slaves and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, the Second Amendment has a nice little racist history built into it as well, depending on where you live. Mm. Yeah, a lot of our founding stuff does. <laughs> Yeah, that, uh -huh. that's kind of, yeah. Kind of what I mean by the whole um, America, um, you know, laying down the groundwork and then other countries around the rest of the advanced world picking the ball up and running with it is because a lot of the stuff America laid out was what the rest of the world based their constitutions on and stuff, but they developed them quicker and they were, had a more flexible attitude towards them. And also, um, you know, America, if you actually think about it, America was, the constitution's really bigoted, you know. It says all men are created equal, so they're already ignoring women out of that. But that all men are created equal is only talking about white people. Very specifically, it's talking about white people. Mm. And, and you also, I think guys, in the so. Declaration, yeah, in the Declaration of Independence, I believe there's a there are comments in there about how like the King of England had de dereliction of duty because he left them to the mercy of the savage Indians. Um, so, you know, there are also some really uncomfortable passages in, in those founding documents, but they're toward the end and people don't tend to read those out at, you know, the 4th of July picnics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I've been to many of those in my day. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think um, that I, I made this list that I might do a series of videos about at some point in the future. I made this list of people that I consider to be the sort of founders of the modern world um, for good or bad. You know, there's a lot of heroes of mine on there, but there's also a lot of fucking horrible pieces of shit like uh, Gustave Le Bon, who, you know, pioneered scientific racism and, and, um, you know, was an anti-working class, you know, anti, anti proletariat rhetoric and stuff. So, and you know, people who, um, who, guys like him and others who um, contributed to fascist ideologies and stuff. So th there's a, you know, a lot of mix of people. And one of the people on there is Thomas Jefferson. Even though Thomas Jefferson's own ideas have, uh, uh, to a lot of degree, been kind of undermined in modern America, he was really important for the rest of the world, you know, in terms of, because America laid, that was the first one. That was um, before the French Revolution, you know, that was, the, really the first place that was like, let's have a secular representative republic. And um, so it was a really groundbreaking idea and has since yeah. been adopted by a lot of the rest of the world in really positive ways. So even if America is kind of not, no longer the, um, the exemplary version of those ideas, they're still important ideas. Uh -huh. It's just I saying, think for, oh. <laughs> sorry, go on. <laughs> I was um, going to say that, you know, for me, Jefferson now, you know, as I've moved through my life when he used to be a hero, as all the founding fathers are when you're taught at a young age in school, you learn more and more about the, the men behind the myth, as it were. Mm -hmm. And now when I come to issues of Thomas Jefferson, it's kind of like with Heidegger. When you oh, like, I know what you mean. Yeah. 
being in time, but then you're like, Nazi? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> it, taints, it taints that word. And, and for him, like the fact that he was having sex with one of his female slaves, I'm sorry, if you own a person or they feel owned, they are incapable of giving consent. And every sexual act was rape. Um, yes. Men having yes. sex with their slaves is rape. Or women, f female slave owners, having sex with their slaves, you know, is, is rape because they're not people able to give consent. They're not in, an, in any kind of equitable relationship. And so, yeah, that, that stain now is on there for him, for me, forever. But it doesn't negate some of the other really important ideas he had. It just mm. taints them. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it's that whole, um, it's like the philosophical version of the whole art versus artist argument. You know, like, uh, can you still enjoy, um, God, what's that book by Orson Scott Card called? Um, you know, the one they made that movie, Ender's Game. Can you still enjoy Ender's Game even though you know Orson Scott Card was a is a homophobic piece of shit? <sighs> yes, you can. Yeah, can. But it, unless you are yourself a homophobic piece of shit, it, must, it does have an impact if you know that that is the case with him. You know, it is yeah, a factor. That's... You just can't, you can't totally, se you know, in a perfect world, maybe you could, but in reality, you can't totally separate the two things. And yes, and I think um, a guy like Jefferson and a guy like Heidegger, those are the philosophical, um, ideological versions of that. Yeah. yeah. And in that way, all the founding fathers are kind of turds. Yeah. You know, they're all kind of assets. Yeah. But maybe that's important to remember because mm. it brings the hero worship down a bit. You know, yeah. we can still glean the good and and acknowledge that these men weren't perfect. They weren't demigods. They were just guys who had some good ideas, but also had some really messed up ideas. Yeah, they and were. That's okay. They were part of their time and place. Um, yes. And sure, they undercut with their ideas some of the thing shitty things about their time and place. But they can't undercut. No one person can undercut all the shitty things about their time and place. So they're going to have to be affected by some of them. And a good example of that is a uh, one of the people that I think is probably the most important people in history is a guy called William Wilberforce. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yes, he was a uh, he he pioneered the abolitionist movement. Um, he was the reason why the international slave trade was banned in Britain in 1807, meaning that um, America couldn't pick up slaves from Africa anymore. Uh, and that he was also part, or well, he was almost dead by the time this happened, but he was alive to see it. The banning of, the, of slaves in Britain itself, um, where all the slaves were freed in 1833. Um, but he was also, um, the pi he pioneered animal rights. He was the guy who led to the creation of the, the groups like the SPCA. And so, you know, he was a, a real humanitarian guy, but he was also a right winger and he was conservative in a lot of ways. And so he wasn't perfect. Some of the stuff he said, you know, you look at it now and you're like, Ooh, that's pretty uh, gross, but he was really yeah. important um, for getting rid of slavery and for animal rights. So you can't, you know, it's, it's tricky. I angle. Go ahead, Tom, and then I'll come in when you're done. So, and from my angle, some of my favorite musicians are like garbage bands bags and Vard Vickerness, like I love the first few Burzum albums, but he's a white supremacist and like even going to like jazz, there's a lot of kind of running through jazz and a lot of like race, I forget who the guy is, but there's um there's a jazz history book out there that's basically like written by a white, like all the history of jazz, it's like all told as like being like a white centric thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's plenty of examples of people who like me like really good, really love. Like, um, I think Frank Zappa was a conservative. Vard Vickerness is a white supremacist. Um, I, I'm sure there's and, uh, I have to reconcile. And a hater of Christians as well. Yeah, yeah, that too. Uh, I have to reconcile all that with just the fact that I think they made really good, which is a really weird thing to separate. Yeah, yeah. Because musical ability and natural talent has nothing to do with ideology. Hmm. And so you yeah, get guys could, like, uh, who's that fucking redneck piece of crap um, in America? Shit. Yeah, who's a great guitarist. I knew as soon as you said redneck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> the nuge. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, wanted to get character. back to something. Yes, yeah, I yeah. wanted to get something back to you, uh, Garrett, that, that they were men of their time. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And I think that's actually a really important thing to take away from looking at the flaws of the founding fathers and the ideals that they set out, you know, Jefferson being an example of this, is that they were men of their time, they were constrained, 
um, by their circumstances. And in many ways, we are far more free than they are. So it is our duty to live up to the ideals they themselves could not embody. And we yeah. should, within every generation, get closer and closer to the ideals that our country has set out for us, but we haven't yet reached for everybody. And that's why we can, we can say all people are created equal, echoing the sentiment-ish of what they were saying, but actually really meaning it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, not excluding an entire gender, not excluding ethnic minorities, or like the Irish in some cases, you know. Um, even some right. white people were considered not okay, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. What's that's that? happening in the UK with uh, Polish immigrants, of course. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. Not just Polish, Czech, you know, Finnish, yes. whatever. Just basically mm -hmm. anywhere from vaguely west of, like, France. Mm. Especially not east. the French. Sorry, east. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I agree. The, the, the whole, and, it, you know, it's the same with, uh, you know, I don't know if I've mentioned this on my channel much, but I'm a, I'm a Buddhist. Um, I don't have religious beliefs, but it's a, it's a, you know, philosophical way of life, philosophical ideology. Um, and it's the same with him. He was a, he was a man of his time, you know, and um, so he was able to subvert some of the uh, preconceived notions of his era, but not all. For example, he rejected the idea of the human soul, which was totally intrinsic to Hinduism. Totally rejected that, but didn't reject reincarnation. Because some things are just too built in to the fabric of your society. They're just taken for granted, you know? Like the soul is among a lot of religious people now, you know? And so to question certain things, it's, like, um, it's like questioning the troops in America. You just can't do it, you know? You can't say they're, they're aggressive invaders of other countries you know, they're defenders of american freedoms even though that doesn't make any sense you know <laughs> it's it's the same thing with reincarnation in his time it was just too close to home to question it so he didn't he built it into his his philosophy um so yeah you know and now when we look now buddhist modern buddhism can reject it because there's no evidence for it and um around that aside from that with that one issue theravadan buddhism the original version is pretty scientific like they rejected a lot of things where they don't have evidence for them because there was no evidence for them but reincarnation was just a step too far but now we can go okay that also has no evidence for it so we can reject that too fuck it you know it doesn't matter yeah buddhism was my last step before atheism and i was a practicing mahayana buddhist for about yeah five i don't years. i don't vibe with mahayana there's too many like weird this weird shit in that. Although yeah. I, um, I take uh, some aspects of Chan Buddhism, which is the Chinese version of Zen Buddhism, the original Chinese version. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, there's too many like gods, and weird deities and shit and, and all that. Theravadan is, is really back, stripped back to the real essentials, the fundamentals, the basics, you know? Yeah, and that's what I ended up doing, which was basically keeping all the good practical advice self-reflection mm. of the Buddhist teachings and throwing out anything supernatural. Exactly. And I've basically yeah. kept that, I've kept that as a, as a moral framework because it's really, it works really well. It's very ethical. It's very human yeah. life and positive. Um, and, yeah. And there were elements of sexism in his day too, that we can now overcome. Um, yeah, but but, he, he himself actually wasn't very sexist. No, um, no. If you, it's, it's really interesting. Like if you look at um, his history with nuns, the idea of having nuns. Originally, he was against it, but not because he didn't think that women had a place in his, his, his religion. It was because he was worried that because his, his religion was so popular, he would basically travel around India or modern day Nepal in some cases, and he would go to a town and he would like give his a speech or whatever, and a bunch of people from the town would become monks and give up their you know role in the in that town, their role in society. And he was worried how many people were doing it. Like he was kind of gutting these communities. And when the idea of nuns was floated, he was like, that's gonna gut it twice as much. And so he was originally against it, but his own mother um, who was the first nun um, basically convinced him that that was bullshit and that, um, that he's not responsible for that. He, people are making their own choices and if they want to make the choice to leave their community and, and become, a monastic, become an ascetic, become a monastic, then that's up to them, not up to him. And he was like, yeah, that's true. All right, nuns are cool. And from that point on, you know, nuns were basically considered equal in his time. However, there are some Buddhist communities now who are sexist. In Thailand, for example, you can't become a full nun. You can only become what's called an anagarika, which is like a trainee, a guy who's like entry level. That's as far as you can go as a woman, which is sexist as fuck, and it's why I don't like the Thai Buddhist system at all. 
Yeah, but it was also the first um, monastic um, system for women ever founded, if I'm remembering my history correctly. That's correct. Yep, Jainism did not allow women. Um, other ascetic parts of Hinduism didn't allow women. Yep, that's correct. But yeah, it's a good moral framework to start from if you're ever like, because there's a lot of thinking through things and it's based on things that you know, humanists would support, which is compassion. Yeah. And, you know, that whole thing, like, just don't hurt other people. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry. Yep, that's what that's called, our harmlessness. But yeah, um, <clears throat> what I think is really important about Buddhism is that not only is it a good framework for a way of life, but it's also really compatible with the modern world in a surprising way. If you actually look, there's uh, uh, the original Buddhist uh, equivalent of a Bible. It's called the Pali Canon or the Tipitaka, and it's very, very long. It's like 32 volumes or something. It's like a whole bookshelf instead of a book. Um, and you don't really need to read most of it, um, but because a lot of it's really deeply technical, sort of advanced stuff that you really don't need to. But there's one part of it called the Abhidharma, or Ab Ab yeah, Abhidharma, yeah, which is basically Buddhist psychology and laid the groundwork for what what is still modern, the core of modern psychology in the West. They took it all from there, basically. Um, Jung. His whole yeah. thing was like 50% Abhidharma, you know? And so it's amazing that something written two and, two and a half thousand years ago is relevant to today and um, very yeah, much Buddhist useful. Philosophy, yeah, the Buddhist philosophy of mind, they went into a lot of different places. That's and there's exactly a lot what of, Abhidharma is all about, yeah. yeah. There's like this thing called the five baskets, um, which is his, how, how Buddha discounted the idea of a soul. Because basically what he said is that nature, nature has what is necessary for it to continue as a system. And if, if, a, if a system can exist without souls, which is possible, right? Then they probably aren't there because they, that is sort of how nature works is it weeds out what isn't necessary, which is a reductive way to look at it from the point of view of a modern citizen of the world. But in his time was revolutionary and it makes a ton of sense if you think about it. It's like, okay, well, if an organism can exist without a soul, they probably do exist without a soul. You know, it's Occam's razor again. And that was a revolutionary idea um, and a really important one. And the five baskets basically divides up the human being into one part, the body, and the other four parts of the aspects of the mind. So he was the first one to codify what we call consciousness um, and what we call thought processes um, that he, you know, he separated the mind into its various um, categories that is basically still the uh, sort of core of ep uh, epistemology. Hmm. Yeah. The, the sense of um, non-self or no self. Yeah, a not nice, only no core. Yeah, um, yeah. Right. No essential that, you. Mm. Yes, and this is more than just sort of like a soul, but the the idea of there not being an essential you, that yeah. you are a constant stream of experiences and emotional and reactions and intake and yeah. change, um, yet you feel like a solid phenomenon that somehow the there's an yeah. I. Yes, yeah, there's yeah. a sense of the I. And if you yeah. um, want to experience the I, think that you're on a, you know, when you're on a plane and there's turbulence and you get this crap scared out of you, that's the I. Oh yeah. my God, I am going to die. Yeah, that's yeah, That's your exactly. most exp profound experience of the I. And, but that's an illusion. And yeah. so if you can get beyond grasping and protecting your ego, you know, like we do here, and a lot of times you have to do it online with um, not letting what people say get to you, not letting yeah. it affect your I, because there is no I. You know? um, yeah. It is a very helpful way to get a perspective on things and also to understand how people are transient and we change and other people change. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that was a very, very revolutionary idea in um, 500 BCE India. Uh, and it's still to some degree, a pretty revolutionary idea now, which is amazing. And people but, go on about Jesus. Like, you know, all he did was repeat things and it made them slightly more intense, like, you know, mm -hmm. fencing off. Yeah. yeah. You cut out there, Christy. Oh, the last sorry. Thing I, I heard you say was fencing off. Yeah, and then um, you know you got Buddha five hundred years earlier discussing philosophy of mind and sensory yeah. input. You know, you kind of rate these two guys as philosophers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But Buddha like coined terms that we still use now. Thought processes is one that I mentioned earlier, but sense perception or sense data is another one. That um, you know that your basically what the world really is when you get right down to it is your sense organs and the data that they take in and beyond that everything is basically guesswork you know 
Um, and Descartes would take that idea even further and say even the sense data is guesswork. Um, yeah. But I, I think the most important thing about Buddhism is one particular sh very short work inside the Tipitaka called the Kalama Sutta. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it was a totally new concept. Uh, Jainism had kind of floated it, um, but it was in terms of the scale that Buddhism reached it is, was revolutionary, is the idea that of skepticism. Um, what he says in the Kalama Sutta basically goes to this town and the people in the town are like, tell us how the world is, you know, oh wise, you, we've heard how say, what, a, what a sage you are and how smart you are. Tell us, explain the world to us. And he's like, I can't do that. Um, that's up to you. You know, I can give you some of my opinions, but you shouldn't trust them just because I'm a wise guy and other people told you I'm smart. You can't, you have to use your own brains and take in, you take in everything and then work out whether you think it's right or not. And he gave a list of reasons why you shouldn't automatically just accept something. Like don't accept it because a wise guy said it. Don't accept it because it was uh, taken as a given by the society you were raised in, which is something he didn't totally, was not totally able to do in terms of reincarnation. But you know, anyway, so he's like a whole, don't, don't do it. Don't believe it just because the king said it. Don't believe it just because the, the powerful elites agree on it, you know. Well, and it was really the foundation of skepticism, in my opinion, that I know of. Uh, it took Christians, for example, a lot longer than that to come up with, with to start um, bringing in ideas of skepticism. So yeah, th that is the key text, in my opinion, and it's why I call myself a Buddhist, because that text is extremely important to me. You know, it's funny you say that, because I remember I was kind of in, in a place where I, didn't want, I knew I wasn't a Catholic anymore, and I knew that monotheism was just didn't make any sense on moral, logical levels, and I was to Hinduism a bit and sat in on a couple um, like Dharma lights, they were called, sessions with a local Buddhist group, Kadampa Buddhism. Yeah, and oh, the third yeah. one... So don't even get me started on this, people. That's a cult. Yeah. <laughs> well, I turned out okay. I turned out okay. Yeah. Um, they were all really nice to me and not cultish. But anyway, we can talk about that another time. Um, yeah. And I think the third one I went to, the, the monk who was giving the teaching, talked to paraphrase the teaching from Buddha, who said, you know, don't take my te teachings just because they call me teacher. Test them as you would gold yeah. and hammer them out and put yeah. them into yeah. practice. And only then will you know they are true. Yep. I've never heard of that concept before of a religious leader saying, look, don't believe me just because, you know, they give me a title. Go and take this and try it. And then yeah. you'll know for yourself whether it's true. And that to me was just when I was like, okay, I want to hear more. Not only is that not said in other mainstream religions, it's the, it's the opposite of what is said in other mainstream religions. Are that, like literally Jesus said, I am the light and the way and all that crap. But I would never say yeah. anything like that because that is some self-aggrandizing, arrogant, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Delusions of grandeur bullshit, you know, mm. um, and it's totally just off the rails in terms of you trying to pretend to be a sagacious person who should be a leader of, ide of ideas, you know, it's, it's a bankrupt way to, uh, to and, you know, and Buddha also had this thing where he said that, um, this is totally paraphrasing. It's not, I don't, can't remember what, um, what, um, where it's from, uh, what suto it's from, but he basically said, um, that, uh, oh God, I'm losing my train of thought here. Oh crap, I'm going to have to rewatch this and go, what was I talking about again? Something he said. God, I can't remember. He said a lot of stuff. <laughs> well, other teachers, he's not just like, stuff. he's just saying it, but I've never heard any of my teachers in any of my classes ever say, well, you don't have to believe me just because it's in my lecture notes. Go do your own research and find out mm. whether or not it's true. I mean, that's yeah. learn how we are taught to learn. Oh, that's right. He said, um, if everyone in the world thought the same way, all human thought would stop. And that True. it is only by a variety of ideology that human thought is able to progress. Um, so he said, he literally said, if everyone in the world became a Buddhist, it would be a disaster both for everyone in the world and for Buddhism. It would be the end. Um, and so, yeah, th I think that is something you don't hear. That's the opposite of most religion as well. It's an anti-proselytizing yeah. thing. And actually, you know, when I was in um, Korea, uh, I actually had a go at a monk on the street for proselytizing. I was like, Buddha said you shouldn't do this. What are you doing? You're not allowed to do this. And, um, you know, called him out for it. And I also noticed he was smoking cigarettes, which is also fucked up. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Bad monk. Bad monk. 
<laughs> yeah, and he was selling art as well. The whole thing was, was very un-Buddhist. Um, so. Oh, I think I saw some of those guys in Chicago. They tried to sell you a picture, and I'm like, uh, no Buddhist I know would be on the street selling tat for $2 a pop. No, I can thank actually, you, yeah. scam. I can quote exact, exactly what Buddha said and why you shouldn't do that. Uh, it's part of the um, Noble Eightfold Path, you know, which is a series of like it's a lessons of how to live like a decent human being. And one of them is don't profit off shit like that, you know. Um, if, if it's being yeah. done in the name of, of the religion, of the ideology, um, it's called right livelihood. You know, you shouldn't, um, for example, make your living selling trinkets that have magical powers or you know, talismans and all that kind of shit because that is bullshit, you know. It's fraud. Um, and so, you know, you see people in Thailand selling like little Buddhist trinkets that are supposed to be like um, lucky charms. That's totally not okay. You know? Yeah, that happened to me in uh, New York City one time where like a guy, nice beads, like, like a wristband or whatever. And he was like, oh, thank you very much. But then like he, he tried to get us um, to give him like $5. Or, like building a school someplace. But I don't know. It, it's, it felt very strange to me. Like... Um, I don't know. Maybe it's going toward a cause. Maybe it's not. I have no idea. Mm, mm. Yeah. Uh, bounce for like 30 seconds. Just keep talking. <laughs> yeah, sweet as. Yeah, maybe we could even talk about something other than Buddhism. <laughs> it's something I haven't really addressed that much on my channel, but I will at some point. Can can story but um yeah i, I do like I've, I've said before i have a lot of time for it because its approach is very practical and it is one thing that you can personally test out and give it a couple weeks and see how you feel and there's nothing supernatural about it as you said a lot of it's just psychology you know the yeah. idea that you know if you feel jealousy a lot you need to practice rejoicing in others happiness so when something good happens to your coworker and you start to feel jealous go no i need to rejoice something good happened to them i can be happy about that these little yeah. steps, you know, turn you into a happier person. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In, indeed. Yeah, he, uh, there's a thing called the Karaniya Metta Sutta, um, which translates roughly as, the, um, as universal loving kindness, um, which is all about basically wishing everything in the world a good day, basically. Everything, even those you disagree with, those you hate, whatever. Because it's, and it's not about you actually like trying to mystically make them all happy. It's about, it's about you. It's about that mindset is positive, is more positive for the person wishing the happiness. It makes you a better person and more happy person. And so it's very practical. It's not like trying to mystically wish everyone in the world was happy and there was no suffering because the very, very, very most central thing about Buddhism is there is suffering. That's a fact. And so, yeah, it, it's about making the person who's doing the wishing a better human being, you know? And if, yeah, you, that, if you start every day by reading that out, it genuinely does make you a better person. Yeah, one of the weird things when I would go to um, the center would be when we would do the, the various, you know, um, ceremony things where you'd go do the... Um, I can't remember they're called sadhanas, I think. Mm. And, you know, you have to do the um, bowing, you know, which is very big in Southeastern and Asia and yep. East Asian yep. culture. Um, and it felt weird to me, like as an American and also as someone who wanted to get away from Catholicism, where there's a lot of kneeling. Uh, but, you know, there <laughs> yeah. are obviously all traditions behind this. But one way to think about it is, um, as somebody explained, that you don't have to think about it as, you know, respecting a statue of Buddha. You can think about getting your mind ready to hear teachings. And it's kind of like a physical act for you to kind of start to associate with a quieter mind and listening now and thinking and reflecting. So there are ways to look at these rituals that aren't necessarily about supernatural worship, but sort of the sort of, you know, a Tai Chi or meditative practices of the body that are not really found except for maybe um, self, uh, when you hurt yourself um, in the Christian tradition, um, their focus on the body is usually quite negative. So, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I uh, actually wrote a book um, well, a long time ago now, 2005 maybe. Uh, I never published it because uh, well, I don't think it was good enough, but it was about Buddhist cults. Um, and I use the term cult uh, probably in a more um, severe way than you might. Like I called Kadampa a cult where I guess maybe by the dictionary definition of what a cult is, it might not be. Um, but there's certain words that are just used in a more strict, um, not strict, the opposite, I guess, um, way in Buddhism, like a heresy, for example. 
Uh, you can be heretical about Buddhism in a way that like, you wouldn't use that word in another religion. For example, um, what you were just saying about ritual, that is one of the reasons why I don't hang out in Buddhist circles and stuff, because that is against the Kalama Sutta. That's believing in something just because of tradition. Don't, you know, it says literally in there, don't do it just because it's tradition. Uh, and uh, so I reject that stuff. Like, for example, they, uh, one group I was at made, pe wanted people to, to um, chant in Pali, you know, the dead, dead Indian language Pali. And I was like, I don't even know what this means. I'm not going to chant something that I don't know what it means. So, no, I'm not going to do that. And they don't really like that when you don't want to do that stuff. <laughs> so I don't really hang out with them. Um, I, I do that. spend some time <laughs> in a monastery that's a while away from my house because those are just decent, those monks are really cool and stuff. Um, yeah, and that was my, uh, that was actually new Kadampa, which is even more culty than um, traditional Kadampa. Uh, for people that don't know, Kadampa is a Tibetan um, style of Buddhism that was competing with um, Vajrayana, which is mainstream Tibetan Buddhism. They've always been sort of competing with each other, and uh, basically Vajrayana won, and Kadampa's basically been sidelined. And, and then there was this version of it called new Kadampa that was um, in, created mostly in the West, which is very culty and very weird. I went there um, to put up... I, I'd say I was NKT. Just so I went, oh, right, yes. so you were the really weird one. <laughs> Yeah. My experience was a lot of them are probably okay, but like here's the story that I had with them. So I am um, at the end of one of my stays uh, at the monastery that I go to. I haven't gone there in years, but you know, sometimes um, I was passing out flyers at Buddhist groups because they were getting this um, really world renowned monk called Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm of Amso, who's like a big deal in the um, Theravadan world. He was coming to give a talk. And um, so they were like, oh my God, this is a huge deal. Um, so they were passing out flyers. I went to the new Kadampa center in my city and the guy was like, oh, we don't accept outside teachings here. And he wouldn't let me put the flyer up. I was like, you are a cultist. Fuck you, basically. That is. Ugh. Well, you that's don't a bit like asking outside. a Catholic. What does that fucking mean? Like, it's totally bullshit. It's kind of like yeah. asking a Catholic church to have a Mormon person come in and preach, though. I mean, no, but it wasn't. They weren't speaking there. They were speaking at the monastery. It was just a fly. It was just an ad for that, you know. And they're supposed to be Buddhist, right? So I don't know. It seemed it seemed very weird. And you know, that's fine. Your your analogy doesn't quite work because Christianity and Buddhism aren't the same. You know, there's the, well, they don't I mean, have the same emphasis like on free thought. You know. That goes against what Buddhism is supposed to be about, to say, well, you don't accept outside teachings. That's insanity. Buddha would never yeah. have stood for that. Yeah. Well, I was in there for five years and went to some of the, um, you know, uh, empowerment rituals kind of things. And I, I was never asked for money. It was all donations. And it was a very nice group of people. And I really have nothing but nice things to say about them. So I mean, my they're experience... There are way worse Buddhist cults uh, in the world than them. Way worse. I mean, they, they make them look like totally fine by comparison. Uh, oh, the worst one is... Yeah, I guess I would, just, I would just disagree with the characterization of cult. I mean, that might be your term for it, but I'll just go on record saying that that was not my experience or anyone that I knew, you know, experience at all. So just yeah, like, for fine. the record. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's fine. But yeah, there are definitely ones that I would not hear dissent about them being a cult because they fit the dictionary definition of what a cult is, like uh, Soka Gakkai International. I don't know if you know about them, but there are Japanese Buddhist cults who um, are extremely aggressive and have enemies and stuff. It's just a very weird thing, not Buddhist at all. Um, they have this uh, rivalry with another Buddhist group called... Uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but they basically have this hate boner for another Buddhist group and they were doing things like wiretapping the houses of some members of this group. They were installing cameras and, and stuff. They, were, they, crazy. Would, um, they would stalk and harass people who tried to leave the group um, for any reason. They had, uh, they at one point did an invade, like invade, like a home invasion equivalent on a, on a, um, Mon not a monastery, but like a, I guess, a religious center for this other group. They ran in and like with weapons, and it was cra it's crazy. And the, those guys are part of what um, I called the new religions in J in Japan in the fifties after World War Two. A whole bunch of cults basically sprung up, uh, and some of them became state endorsed. Like Soka Gakkai was state endorsed for a while, maybe still is. I don't have no idea. Um, and th they were all like Scientology level sort of cults, you know. Um, very weird stuff. Very, very weird indeed. I, if you want to have a, a fascinating read about a group that is totally going against everything that's supposed to stand for, 
Then Soka Gakkai is a good place to start. Another one is Aum Shinrikyo, also Japanese, also one of the new religions. Love them, yeah. Yeah, they're not actually a Buddhist cult because um, nobody really considers them, takes them seriously as Buddhists. Um, but they, they basically a hodgepodge of Western, of Eastern thought mashed together in a way that really conflicts and is mutually exclusive. So they're a yeah. fucking mess. But they did that sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway. Yeah, they're terror. Yeah, they're terror. they they're, and that was in the nineties, and they've, they've been defunct oh. basically for for a long time. But those guys are crazy as well. Worth worth reading about as well. There was that really? sort of game theory about them. Oh, yeah? Really? <laughs> yeah, where, like, um, the Om Shurikyo is basically parody. So, but it's cool. Uh, you cut out there. Did I? Um, basically, the Omba kind of parodied in Earthbound. Like, there's a similar group who all dresses in blue yes. and does a bunch of weird cultish shit. I've actually seen that episode, the Earthbound episode. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, yeah. 